Hi everyone, we're gonna get started soon. We're gonna wait about another minute for the rest of the class to join. Uh, while you're waiting to, for us to get started, you can go ahead and type into the chat where you're watching the class from and also how you heard about the class. And that would be awesome if you could just type that right into the chat, thank you. Got a pretty good uh, spread of people. There's people from all over the place. It's very cool. Um, so if you just joined, you can go ahead and type where you're watching the class from and also how you heard about the class. I know Xerxes did some of their own advertising, so it's nice to see where they were seen from. And there are uh, people from all over the place. We got some California, we got some New York, some right in Hillsborough. That's very cool. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Jeff Geist. I'm programs coordinator at Duke Farms, and thank you for joining. There are still people coming in, so I'm just going to do a quick introduction. Um, so first, just for some Zoom information, this is a webinar, so you are automatically muted and your videos are off. So if you have any questions or you wanted to say any comments, you can go ahead and type them into the chat and the Q&A, and then people are already doing it, but go ahead and type where you are watching the class from and also how you heard about the class. Um, so we are talking about monarch butterflies today. Typically in a normal August, Duke Farms would have an entire month dedicated to monarch butterflies and meadows and pollinator conservation. And we're not doing in-person programming right now. So we went virtual. So everything is online. Uh, we have an entire distance learning portal that has lesson plans and resources and activities all dedicated, all the ones that have been going up the past few weeks are all related to monarchs, meadows, pollinators. And I will go ahead and include that link in the chat. So if anyone's interested, check that out. Um, so I'm going to introduce our presenter today is Kelly Gill. She's the senior pollinator conservation specialist for the Xerxes Society. And she's going to talk today about monarch butterfly conservation and what we can do to help out monarchs. So I'm going to mute myself and turn it over to Kelly. Thanks for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. I am so happy to be here on this Friday afternoon. Um, although we would all love to be, you know, um, walking through the meadows of Duke Farms and looking at bees and butterflies and other insects and flowers in person, hands on. Um, I hope you enjoy this and find it useful. And I tried to load it up with lots of pictures to give you the effect that you're out in, in a meadow. Um, <clears throat> Before we start, I just want to acknowledge um, a, a few people here. I want to give a special thanks to Duke Farms for inviting me and coordinating this webinar and for their whole Monarch and Meadow series. Um, I'm sure some of you have attended the other presentations. I've watched a few and, and they've been really good. So please do check those out. And also the whole Earth Center um, in Princeton who provided funding for this opportunity today. And then any Xerces Society members, we are a member founded or a member supported organization. So thank you to you if you are a member. I'll have information on how you can become a member if you're not. And then we have a, um, you know, a long list of supporters and donors here on this page that I would like to thank. Just for a little background about the Xerces Society, if you are unfamiliar what the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation is and what we do. Um, we've been working for almost 50 years and our goal is to protect wildlife through the conservation of invertebrates and their habitat. So we'll talk a little bit in the intro about how invertebrates are linked and how they're really a keystone species in ecological systems. Um, we do focus on a lot of different invertebrates and we have uh, several program areas you could check out on our website at xerces.org. Pollinator conservation is one of them. We also work on conservation biological control, so other beneficial insects, agricultural biodiversity. We have an endangered species team. We have a whole team of folks and scientists who work on aquatic um, and watershed 
conservation, so aquatic invertebrates and their habitats, pesticide protection. We have urban conservation opportunities, several uh, community science and engagement opportunities that you can get involved in. And then we have uh, programs like Bee City and Bee Campus USA, which is a, a community-based program to get you, if you and your like-minded friends together and make your city or town or burg a bee city and campus. And I have more inf information on those opportunities and how you can get involved at the end of this presentation. But please do go online and explore the vast amounts of information on our website. We're named after this blue butterfly you see here. This is the Xerces blue butterfly. It's our namesake. This butterfly was endemic to um, parts of the West Coast near San Francisco Bay Area. And as that um, area got built up, developed, the specific habitat that this bu butterfly needed um, was removed from the landscape. And essentially, um, that caused the species to go extinct, no longer exists. And so that's our reminder to protect these species no matter how small. Along with on the ground conservation, I said we have these other programs, Be Better Certified, Be City and Be Campus USA. You can learn all more about this on our website. Um, this is a picture of me here on the side, just doing a plug for Duke Farms. Um, I have done a few programs there over the years, including outdoor education, and here we are collecting insects and identifying them from the meadow. So please, it's a beautiful place. If you haven't visited, please do. I wanna start off, I have a few slides just about the importance of invertebrates in general and biodiversity conservation, because that's really our large long-term goal. And this is the lens we work through as we do our work, whether it's habitat restoration or alike. So insects are the most diverse group of animals on the planet. There's over a million described species and counting. Only a tiny fraction of insect species are pests and only a tiny fraction of them are economically important pests. Most of them are beneficial. And so that's the reason why we focus on them today. If you can see this pictogram here, you see this very large beetle, right? And so the images on this pictogram, uh, the image is um, a depiction of the size of the organism, the size of the organism as a proportion of diversity it represents. So up in this corner here, you can see a tiny bear, right? That's the proportion of animals that are mammals. Here you see birds, um, some other marine animals, but largely our planet is run by these smaller invertebrates, um, including insects and their relatives, things like crustaceans and mollusks, anything that doesn't have a backbone. So insects are number one in the rank of diversity um, within animal species. I feel like this is important to say because uh, for a long time, invertebrates have been largely overlooked when you think about wildlife conservation. You think of big charismatic uh, megafauna, things like polar bears and alike. And while that's important as well, you know, these animals also deserve a place in conservation. Um, sustaining the abundance, diversity, and biomass of these insects is essential for healthy ecosystems. These are the little things that run the world. Um, and they do uh, not only contribute to biodiversity, but these ecosystem services that uh, people and as well as animals depend on. So things like you see this dung beetle here providing some decomposition, right? Animals are the main decomposers of um, or I'm sorry, insects are the main de decomposers of human and animal waste, right? So it'd be a very different world without them. Biological control. So we here you see a predatory stink bug eating a herbivorous or pest stink bug, which is really kind of cool. Um, this is a reminder to not put every insect, you know, in the same category. We do have some good stink bugs, right? They're the base of our food web. So they feed birds and fish and other animals, even mammals. And then we have pollination by not only our managed honeybees, but also about 3,600 species of native bees, most of which are solitary. Today, we're gonna to focus on monarchs and I'm gonna start off with their conservation status. Um, 
So, you know, monarchs are really important species culturally, and also um, they're a, a great umbrella species for pollinator conservation at large, and also the conservation of other important invertebrates and vertebrate species. So think of them as a flagship for conservation. And the things that we're going to recommend doing for monarchs or pollinators really have benefits beyond those species. So why are monarchs declining? You've probably heard this in some of the other presentations in this series, but it's complicated, right? And they face multiple threats. So I'm just gonna go through this. It might be a reminder for some of you. I only have a few slides here, but it's hard for scientists to tease these threats apart because a lot of them are working in unison, right? So some of the most obvious things are habitat loss, pesticides, disease and non-native species, and climate change. Disease, parasites, and predation all impact monarch populations. So if you think of this naturally, only about one to 10% of monarch eggs and caterpillars survive to become adults. And some of these have natural predators um, such as birds or tachinid flies, which are a parasitoid, um, and praying mantids, right? And especially when we think of the non-native praying mantids that are very indiscriminate predators of a lot of different things, including monarch, caterpillars, adults, bumblebees, a lot of beneficial species, even sometimes hum uh, hummingbirds. So I know people find these uh, uh, mantids very neat and cool, and they are, but introducing um, Chinese mantids to your garden or your system isn't really a great way to get rid of pests because they're so indiscriminate. And at some point they will be feeding on insects that you don't want them to be feeding on. There's also parasites um, across, you know, all pollinators get sick. Here we're gonna talk a little bit about um, a protozoan called OE which impacts um, pollinators at the population level. So this is a protozoan parasite. We'll talk a little bit more later. Um, this parasite reduces migration success. Severe infestations of OE in monarchs can slow development, cripple adults. So adults will emerge um, weak from the chrysalis weak or they'll have crippled wings and it reduces reproductive fitness. We see very high levels of of OE in um, non-migratory populations in Florida and the Gulf states. So it's a problem there, but it can be a more widespread problem. So we'll talk a little bit about that later when we're talking about conservation actions. Widespread habitat loss, of course, I mean, this is pretty obvious. This is not just impacting monarchs. This is impacting pollinators at large other wildlife, humans, the health and the function of our landscape overall. I mean, it is just monumental, the widespread habitat loss. Um, and this includes things like farmland that could have been more diverse at one point, having edges that supported wildlife or wild, intact wild areas. So one example you see here, um, I have this nice kind of picture of a meadow. Um, of course, this looks like great habitat for a bunch of species. This monoculture crop field of corn, not so much. And when we talk about, you know, human developed landscapes, I mean, there's not a whole lot of green space in this picture. So this is kind of what I call the no duh. Um, just to give you one statistical example, the US is losing more than 5,000 acres per day to real estate and energy development alone. And there's other ways we're losing habitat as well. But that is just monumental. And this is really something we can all contribute to. So when we talk a little bit later about what we can do, habitat loss will be the focus. We also see loss of habitat, and this is a little more specific to monarchs, in their overwintering habitat. So we'll talk a little bit about migration and where the eastern and western uh, population of monarchs overwinter. But these habitats are forested and they're impacted by logging, um, which has degraded or fragmented or reduced the amount of roosting sites for monarchs to overwinter in. 
when these uh, overwintering sites are reduced in size and location or geography and they're shrinking, this gives a, a bigger opportunity for um, high impacts by things like storms. So these, you can see in this picture here, these monarchs are roosting. If a storm comes and hits an area, you know, one of these small areas that remains, you know, those monarchs are highly impacted compared to being more spread out. So there's a lot of variation um, in what these effects are and these impacts year to year and throughout the years that are impacting and causing declines in these populations. So it's a complicated puzzle. Tack onto that things like climate change, in particular drought. So we've seen that drought has been associated with a lower abundance of overwintering monarchs. Many trees at overwintering sites are dead or drying because of multi-year droughts. Um, impacts on milkweed, their host plants, we, think, we see things like early senescence. Um, so they're going dormant earlier, uh, increased duration of dormancy, reduced palatability to monarch larva, decreased nectar production or recharge, and then these extreme weather events such as winter storms and overwintering habitats that can cause increased mortality and shifts in suitability of overwintering sites. So this is another big um, monumental kind of problem that is, um, you know, it's very hard to figure out what to do and uh, there's a lot of scientists working on it, including the Xerces Society. And climate change is impacting other species as well, in particular, um, disproportionately um, aquatic species as our waters warm and these species that need very cold water are starting to be impacted and be in decline. Um, also, some of them becoming at risk. Insecticides, um, in general, things like herbicide, overuse of herbicide can take away host plants, milkweed plants, nectar plants, um, from monarchs and other pollinators. And then there's direct impacts of insecticides, whether it's um, you know, direct exposure that kills an insect outright. This is a, a bumblebee example here in the, the picture. Um, but sometimes a uh, um, small amounts, small exposure to um, insecticides over time, in particular systemic insecticides that are taken up into the um, vascular system of a plant and expressed in pollen and nectar. You know, uh, pollinators may feed on these plants and get small doses over time that don't kill them outright on their first sip, but have these sublethal long-term effects such as impacting their ability to navigate, forage, reproduce, um, all kinds of brain activity impediments. So this is really, really important when we think about this. And this is not just occurring in agroecosystems with agrochemicals. The picture you see here is um, a large scale bumblebee kill. This is a, uh, you know, a fairly older example. You might've heard of it, but this happened in a Target parking lot where a landscaping company was treating um, tilia or basswood trees, which are really, really attractive to a number of pollinators. They're prolific nectar producers, um, but they had aphids and the aphids were causing, were feeding on the plant and excreting honeydew, a sugary substance that they excrete when they feed on uh, plant sap. And that was landing on cars in the parking lot. And so people had complained that, you know, this was impacting their cars. It's totally soluble. You can wash it off. Um, but the landscaping company wanted to, you know, the manager of the Target wanted to do something. They called this landscaping company. They applied this insecticide at a time when you weren't supposed to uh, apply it during plant bloom. And this is what happens. So it's not just, you know, our agricultural systems. It's also our urban and suburban landscapes, things like mosquito spraying, tick spraying. Um, the same neonicotinoids you can use on crop fields are available as formulations um, in your home and garden center. So be very careful to read those, um, you know, and, and eliminate those chemicals if you can from your landscape. So what do these population declines look like? So our eastern population of monarchs overwinter in Mexico. We've been tracking these populations since the 90s, counting them at their overwintering site. 
Um, in the 90s, we had nearly 700 million monarchs migrating to Mexico. So the picture you see behind the text here, you know, the, the skies were full of monarchs, essentially. By 2015, we saw a, a huge decrease down to 150 million. And then the next year, again, a humongous decrease down to 60 million. California and in the western uh, part and the western population of monarchs in the western part of the country are seeing also a tremendous decline, very precipitous, one plus million monarchs in the 90s. In 2017, less than 200,000. Um, I should say for the people joining from the west coast, if you look at Xerxes YouTube channel, we have several um, uh, presentations posted specific to the Western population of monarchs, but the concepts within this presentation here will apply as well. So this is what it looks like. This, um, this shows the total area occupied by monarchs at their overwintering sites. We count them there. It's, it's much easier than counting individual monarchs flying through the landscape, we need, um, which would be, you know, largely impossible without tagging efforts. But we count them at their overwintering sites, and this shows the hectares of occupancy. And you can see there is natural variation in each year, and this is typical, but we're seeing these declines and we're still seeing them um, even into this year. So we have an estimated uh, at 300, or 35 million monarchs per hectare. That's an 84% decline since 1996. Um, scientists are calling this a substantial probability of a quasi-extinction, in particular the extinction of the phenomenon of migration. And we just keep seeing these very low numbers. So we don't want to see this anymore. We're trying to take action now to reverse these trends. Um, Xerxes has worked on the conservation status and ecology of the monarch butterfly. You can find all of these resources on our website. We've worked with NatureServe to do a conservation status assessment. This is a standardized method to evaluate extinction risk. And we find that um, the western or the eastern population are vulnerable. Western monarchs that overwinter in California are imperiled or vulnerable. And then the eastern uh, monarch population overwintering in Mexico is critically imperiled. So let's talk about a little bit about uh, monarch and milkweed biology. If we want to properly conserve an animal, we have to know how it lives, right? And we have to plan ahead to conserve or provide for this animal all, uh, through all of its life cycle. So we're going to look at this a little bit. I'm sure this is review for most people, but here's the life cycle. Um, when monarchs are migrating, they migrate north to uh, our area here in the mid-Atlantic or northeast. They lay eggs on the underside of milkweed leaves. There's different species of milkweed we'll talk about today. They're in that egg stage for three to five days. They hatch into a caterpillar that goes through about five instars through molting. Then they form a chrysalis. They stay in that chrysalis 10 to 14 days. This is all dependent on weather and other conditions. And then they merge as an adult. The breeding generations of adults live for about two to five weeks. The overwintering generation lives longer, about six to nine months. And here you can see the um, going from chrysalis. This is the green chrysalis. You can see these nice gold embellishments on them. They're very beautiful to adult stage. Again, we have these two um, um, life cycle areas or life cycle points where we want to provide for these monarchs. So during the breeding season and also during the overwintering season, right? Um, this is a challenge as we think about, you know, life um, insects or animals that are, you know, not migrating, even supporting them through their whole life cycle is challenging. Add in uh, an animal that moves throughout the country that adds another level of complexity. And so we'll talk about that a little bit here. <clears throat> 
So in the east, there's two main flyways, the central flyway going um, through the center of the country, essentially through the prairie states. And then we have the eastern flyway here. If you are lucky enough to go to Cape May um, during migration season, you can see mass amounts of monarchs flying through. Um, this is important when we think about planting for monarchs and where we are geographically, right? So if we're in um, New Jersey and we plant something that blooms very early, say April or May, this may be a very good plant in the southern part of the country to feed those migrating monarchs as they come from their overwintering spots north, but it's not going to synchronize that bloom period with when monarchs are in our area. So that's something to think about. Right? So this is a really cool example of monarch migration. So we're going from the overwintering site in spring north. This is from a site um, and an organization called Journey North. You can all participate in collecting data for this. This is a community science project where people submit their first sightings of adult monarchs. So this is spring in March, April, you see these are moving north, May, June, August, we're going to start going south here soon, September, October, and so on. So when we think about planning habitat or conservation of habitat, we really want to focus, if we're looking at monarchs, on those um, host plants, milkweed, and on the nectar plants that are blooming at the time that they're in our area as they go north and south, um, the migratory stages. That way they have these stopover points or these um, so-called, you know, gas stations to refuel. You know, they weigh about the size of a paper clip. Um, some of them fly 25 to 30 miles per day constantly stopping to refuel on nectar, which is their carbohydrate source for energy, right? They do feed on milkweeds for nectar as well. So we know uh, milkweeds are an oviposition site. We talked about that a little bit earlier. They're the larval food source. They're also, um, so the larva can form pupa on milkweed or nearby plants or other structures. A lot of times I'll see them like along a fence or something solid that they've attached their chrysalis to. And milkweeds and many other plants are an adult nectar source. We really promote the planting of native milkweeds. And we have a lot of resources to help you source and figure out what native milkweeds are best for your area. And also the, the site conditions, the site specific conditions, right? So these are the obligate host plant for caterpillars. If you don't have milkweed to support caterpillars, you're not going to get the adults. They're really the center piece of this, um, of their life cycle, right? <clears throat> so anywhere in that chain, the migratory, the overwintering um, cycle, migratory back north or breeding populations, really depend on milkweed and their nectar plants. If something in that chain is broken, and of course they're overwintering sites, if something in that chain is broken, that life cycle is, is just harder to complete, right? So we wanna keep that in consideration. We want to have these high quality nectar um, sources for pollinators as well. So they not only benefit butterflies and monarchs, but bumblebees and other beneficials and if you want to find out which uh, milkweed species are right for your region, um, you can visit our website. There's information on all different areas of the country. Oops. Here in the Northeast or Mid-Atlantic, um, we mostly have common milkweed, Asclepias syriaca, butterfly milkweed, which is Asclepias tuberosa, and swamp milkweed, uh, which likes a little bit uh, wetter sites, Asclepias incarnata. You may also see, but a little less common, um, world milkweed and poke milkweed. If you visit our site, we have plenty of guides that um, talk about milkweed, describe them, give you identifying characteristics, um, give you characteristics on their growing conditions and other information. So please um, 
these actually say Nebraska and the Dakotas, but we do have some for Mid-Atlantic as well. I, I forgot to swap them out. Um, so we have Northeast and Mid-Atlantic guides too. We also have a milkweed seed finder. If you're looking for um, companies that produce native milkweed seeds for your area, this is an interactive tool on our website where you can put in what species you're looking for, what state you're in, and then search for a seed uh, provider or nursery for that. So we're trying to make it easier. If you are a milkweed grower and you want to get on our website um, as a provider, please let us know. We're always looking to expand this database. So milkweed is critically important for other insects. It is one of the top plants for pollinators and other beneficials. It just attracts droves of, of insects including flies, wasps, butterflies, hummingbirds, nocturnal moths, and bees. It has specialist associations as well, so specialist herbivores, um, and then other applications. So for example, birds will use the, the seed and floss for nesting material. So when, again, when we're planting milkweed, we're not just helping monarchs, we're helping a whole range of species diversity. The other thing is nectar plants. We do focus on milkweed and like I said, milkweed can be a nectar plant, but you know that milkweed has a restricted bloom period. We need plants that are blooming before and after that as well for that fuel I talked about um, for the migrating and breeding populations. Again, we have a regional monarch nectar plant guide on our website. You could click on a map and get lists for your area. Here I'm displaying the mid-Atlantic and Northeast examples. And here's what the inside of that guide looks like. And I'm showing you this because I really like the fact that it gives a little bit of, of information on height, water needs, some notes on each of these nectar species or nectar plant species, and then you get these little thumbnail pictures here, which shows just a, what a great diversity of form and beauty these plants provide for the landscape. And this has herbaceous plants, but also trees and shrubs and vines as well. So if you're looking to build a butterfly garden, please consult these lists. There is something for everyone on here. Um, and you may look at the list and say, Kelly, I have plants in my garden. I know they're native plants to my area and they're just covered in, in um, monarchs or pollinators and they're not on the list. This list is not all inclusive. There's many more options. You can always consult us for advice on that. Some of the species, some of the top species might not be listed here because they're not as commercially available as others. So they're hard to find and that's really disappointing when you're a person trying to look for those. Um, we do not promote planting non-native milkweeds in your area, um, especially tropical milkweed, which you can see here. It looks very similar to butterfly milkweed in that it has those unique orange flowers, has those lance kind of linear shaped leaves, erect habitat, um, but it is evergreen. So um, especially in warm regions, it doesn't die back like our other milkweeds do. And this milkweed is problematic in the south um, because of that evergreen habit. It can impede um, migration for some um, adults. So some will become in uh, nine. Uh, well, some of them will join the non-migrating population in Florida. And then in other instances, this can be a harbinger for that uh, protozoan parasite OE that I described earlier. So we really want to discourage planting these plants and focusing on native milkweeds to our area. We have some similar looking species, including dogbane, um, <laughs> uh, which isn't a bad pollinator plant. It's closely related to milkweeds. Um, monarchs may, although rarely lay eggs on this, but they they don't support that monarch life cycle. So they won't develop to adults on this plant. And this can also be very uh, aggressive. So if you have dog bane infesting a meadow, um, it does need to be controlled if it is swamping out the other diversity. So if it's displacing other native plants, you know, 
um, even though it's a native itself, it restricts that bloom, that nectar and pollen availability to a certain time period. So our, our goal is to aim for diversity. So what is high quality monarch habitat? We describe this in four general components. Of course, the larval host plants, those native milkweeds, nectar plants, ideally with a diversity of species and overlapping bloom periods. So we get that season long bloom. I'll show you some of that in a couple slides. Safe places, so places for refuge, um, set asides, buffers, areas that are protected from uh, pesticides, including insecticides and even herbicides. Um, and then other features, trees and shrubs for shade, uh, perching or roosting, water sources are very important as well. So what should you plant? Generally, and this can be for a large uh, landscape or a native plant garden, and I'll show you examples of those as we go through the presentation. So hopefully there's something for everybody here. Um, we do want to focus on native perennial plants. Yes, monarchs will um, visit things like zinnias and other garden plants, and we don't want to necessarily discourage them um, unless they're invasive, you know, things like butterfly bush and the like. Uh, but we do want to focus on native perennial habitats for monarchs and all the other species that are co-evolved with our native plant life in our region, right? as well as because this is a long lasting permanent habitat, right? This provides not only nectar and pollen, but it provides cover throughout the seasons. There's less disturbance because you don't have to replant it. You do have to manage it, but there's less disturbance compared to an annual system. Again, species with high pollinator value, you could find those on our lists. Succession of bloom periods, of course, butterfly host plants, we also mentioned nesting plants for some of our native pollinators who will nest in um, stems. Site appropriate characteristics. Um, I love swamp milkweed, but it is not going to, to grow well in my very dry um, garden, right? Ease of establishment and availability and cost. We also want to make sure that when we are purchasing um, seed or plants that has not been pre-treated with pesticides especially those neonicotinoids. So this is what that season long bloom might look like. And this is to benefit all pollinators. So here in the Northeast or Mid-Atlantic, our spring uh, blooming trees and shrubs really provide the lion's share of resources early in the season. Um, we do have you know, those forest ephemeral wildflowers but we don't have a lot of our perennials growing very early in the season. So things like redbud and willow and serviceberry are really great plants to have in the landscape. Although they may not line up with uh, monarchs for nectaring, they're very important for a wide array of other um, pollinators and beneficials. In the, season, in the summer, we have a lot of options. We have milkweed. I know people might be cringing here at this thistle picture, but this is a native thistle. Um, this is um, sol um, Circium discolor, which is basically has been eradicated from our landscape, even though it's a very, very important high quality uh, pollinator plant for a wide range of species. It's been eradicated due to the efforts to control non-native thistle. So not all thistles are bad. You can learn more about native thistles on our website. Some of them are just really high value plants for pollinators. Here you see elderberry and button bush, things that might like a little wetter area. And of course, we're going into the season here where monarchs are gonna be fueling up on things like goldenrod and asters to make that long journey south again to their overwintering sites. Here's just some examples of, of what that looks like in habitat plantings. So we kind of have this forested edge habitat planting here where you see red bud blooming and a lot of understory plants before that canopy has closed. Um, even things like red clover, um, even, even though we prefer native plants, red clover can be beneficial to monarchs. I have seen them nectaring on it and other bees. Again, in the summer, things like Monarda, coneflower, milkweed, sunflower, our native roses, button bush, these are things you're going to find on our plant list. 
those asters and goldenrod, you may think, oh, there's a lot of goldenrod in the landscape. We need a lot of it. That is such an important plant for not only migratory monarchs, but um, bumblebee queens getting ready to overwinter and even honeybees. Grasses, we like to include native grasses. They provide uh, added structure, added functional groups to the landscape. But also we do have some uh, butterflies like skippers that use these as host plants. They have all these plants have other uh, resource benefits as well. Uh, you know, providing erosion control, helping water infiltration, providing perennial color, providing diversity and beautifying the landscape. Plants bloom everywhere, but pollinators need the right type of flower. So a lot of times people will say, Kelly, I've planted all these flowers in my, in my garden and I don't see any pollinator activity. Well, these garden varieties that are bred for kind of um, aesthetic or visual um, qualities may not be the best plants for supporting pollinators or monarchs, right? So these ornamental varieties can look pretty but don't have much habitat value. Um, cultivated varieties such as those that have those showy or double petals. Um, often those petals are formed in place of anthers and that plant has little or no pollen or nectar can be inaccessible. We see this a lot in cut flowers that are bred for not having pollen because you know a beautiful bride doesn't want to carry a bouquet of sunflowers and get yellow pollen all over her dress. Um, so be careful when you're purchasing these and, and um, looking at the, those varieties or even native ours. Um, the verdicts out on, on some of the native ours, some are seem to be just as good for pollinators. Maybe some even seem more attractive, but we do see cases where they are less attractive than that straight species. And again, making sure those plants are not pretreated with insecticides. Nesting and overwintering sites. Now we know monarchs are migrating, but I just have to put a plug in for nesting sites for bees and wasps um, and, and our butterflies that don't migrate, right? Sometimes they attach themselves to stems, they're rolled up in the leaf litter, um, other types of plant debris. So when we tend to clean up our landscape, you know, removing leaves, especially if you're bagging them and not using them, you know, to mulch your garden or in your compost pile, you are getting rid of that substrate that these animals need for overwintering, wintering, or depending on the time of season, you could be just getting rid of that overwintering animal itself, right? So butterflies will overwinter and, and other insect species in a variety of stages. So some overwinter as eggs, pupa, larva, and they, they tuck themselves in these little nooks and crannies or under plant material or in the soil to survive winter. Right? We wanna keep those in our landscape so we could see them the following season. Okay, so transitioning here, we talked a little bit about the threats um, to monarchs and other pollinators. We talked about the life cycle of monarchs. We looked at some of those really important habitat components. Now, what does it look like when we put this all together? Um, well, pollinators and even monarchs need landscape scale conservation, right? These are mobile insects. They're found in all different types of landscapes, whether they're migratory or not. In particular, you know, if they are migratory, we're thinking about these monarchs moving throughout our landscape. So we really need this landscape scale conservation and everyone can contribute, right? The reason is only about three to 5% of the American landscape is undisturbed habitat, right? So unless we modify the places where we live, work, play, we're gonna continue to lose that biodiversity. So we really have to change the way we're thinking about the landscape, landscaping and gardening um, you know, moving from that old model of having specimen plants where gardening was uh, essentially tending to these plants one at a time. You know, we have to look at how these plants in combination build a habitat. So creating pollinator uh, friendly landscapes, there's opportunities for almost everybody. 
Here you see a roadside planting. This is a farm road here in the back, a farm lane, and they have used these edge areas, these ditches to provide habitat. That's excellent, right? A lot of people, especially on agricultural lands where I'm mostly working, aren't giving up prime real estate, but they have wet areas, they have lanes, they have odd corners of the fields where they can provide habitat. Um, some of the farmers and landowners I've been working with um, do big installations. So here you see two different meadows, right? Of course, people are really drawn to these meadows, but they can be challenging, challenging to install on bigger scales. We have a lot of habitat guides that walk you through the process and different methods. Farmland biodiversity, not only the diversity of, of wild area or habitat you have in your margins like you see here and in the um, you know, uh, um, odd areas of this vineyard, which you see in the background, but also you know, crop diversity is important as well. I think trees and shrubs are really overlooked. Um, maybe we take them for granted in our area since we are in the forested area and these seem maybe more commonplace than a meadow. But this is exactly what makes a meadow hard to establish is we're trying to establish, you know, something in, a, in an area that wants to grow up into trees. So a meadow constantly has to be managed. So do things like hedgerows and tree and shrub plantings, but they're a little bit easier for those that may not have the equipment or resources to install a, a wildflower meadow. Um, and I like to think of this as, you know, um, a, a tree that's so floriferous, has so many flowers and close proximity really enhances that foraging behavior. You know, it's like building an acre of habitat vertically instead of horizontally across the landscape. So here you can see a, a, a larger hedgerow planting um, on one of our sites. But these smaller areas could be along the side of your house. Maybe you, know, you, you also want a privacy screen from your neighbors. Maybe you have a little wooded lot where you can do some um, layered plantings with an understory, you know, a ground layer, a mid layer, and then tall canopy trees. Again, this is building habitat vertically, stratifying those layers um, of, of different vegetation heights, creating more, um, even though they're linear, you're creating more niches for um, animals, not only pollinators, but birds and other things to move into roadside areas. We have so many roadside areas that are just mowed. Um, for those of you that live in the uh, New Jersey area or travel throughout the state, these plantings are along the Atlantic City Expressway where we've been working with South Jersey Transportation Authority to install acres of, of wildflowers and native plantings along roadsides. Um, so far we've, we've seeded about 30 acres. Not only does this give these um, unused areas habitat and conservation value, but it also gives you a sense of place, right? You can tell by the plants, or at least if you know, you're know you interested in plants, I'm assuming most people here are, that this is the Northeast, right? It's not California. Um, you know, things like those native cosmos plantings are pretty, but really this gives you a nice sense of place as you uh, travel through our state, which I also think is very important urban and residential landscapes. A lot of people seem to think that native plantings are gonna be messy and look wild and unkempt and um, you know, uncontrolled or unmanaged, but that's not the case. Um, this is by Lake Seneca, by their visitor um, um, building here. And there are all these just small areas of garden beds kind of cut out into the lawn throughout this area. And there was tons of pollinator activity, even on this cloudy day when I was visiting. You don't need a large acreage to make a difference. You might need a large acreage for a polar bear or one of those a megafauna I referred to earlier, but pollinators can live in small spaces. And that's what makes pollinator conservation really interesting and unique and fun and available to everybody. You can make a difference. Um, 
the same big picture concepts apply. So native plants, a variety of native plants, including milkweed, having structural elements. Um, this is a little tiny um, habitat planting in front of the community center in my town here in Collingswood, New Jersey. We do a few things differently when we're working in small spaces. Um, you know, when we do a seeding, we have a diverse seed mix and we distribute those seeds across a large acreage. And over time, those plants find their favorable microclimates within that planting. So you might see them grouping or clumping themselves naturally. We expedite this um, phenomenon when we do our plantings in a garden setting or in small spaces. Uh, instead of scattering seeds or planting one of every plant that you like, clump like species and provide these big visible clumps where there's lots of flowers in close proximity. So uh, a, a pollinator or a monarch can fly from this flower to this flower to this flower. Um, extremely important for bees who are collecting mass amounts of pollen as well. You, know, you may see butterflies flutter al around a little more but this increases visibility. It concentrates those resources in, in a nice small area and increases that foraging efficiency. So these bees don't have to go to, you know, every supermarket in town to get something to eat. Including those bunch grasses for structure, using these locally sourced open pollinated plants, not clones, and again, making sure your plants are insecticide free. So what does this look like in small spaces? Um, so we have over 40 million acres of lawn in the U.S., making turf the single largest irrigated crop in the country, even larger than commodity crops like corn. Of course, this lawn picture here, you know, may contribute to throwing a frisbee or a picnic, but we could keep some of that lawn, a fraction of that 40 million acres, and still build a lot of pollinator habitat by converting this to more diverse native plant life, right? So taking this and doing something like this, you see, you could bring conservation right to your house. This is a small front yard, uh, could be a backyard, could be an office building. Here you see combination of herbaceous flowering plants, some low growing shrubby plants or woody plants, some vines and trees here, you know, pack that in. Again, it's very different from tending to your specimen plants we're doing these very dense plantings for um, habitat, right? And you can see here this nice pollinator habitat sign, which is available through the Xerces Society, lets people know, don't cut, don't spray. We're doing something here. This is protected habitat. Pocket meadows. So taking that idea of a meadow, those diverse meadows I showed earlier, um, and planting them in small pockets in a yard, Here's um, a coworker's yard. This is a nature center here. They just have these um, flowering natives around their building, their nature center building. Fewer species, but again, these dense plantings. And you can leave a little lawn so it looks very kept and tidy and tended to. And I even find, if you look in the picture here, this, these bricks that are kind of um, providing a border to this habitat do a lot it looks purposeful. So if you surround it with bricks or logs or some kind of pathways, it looks like, um, like you know, a, a garden instead of an unkept wild area if you're afraid that your neighbors or your homeowners association might balk at that type of planting. Again, these are all just backyards, small areas. Here's a combination of native and, and non-native annuals. Um, some of them are even in pots. Large planters, large pots can be beneficial. Small rain gardens. This is a, a tiny planting outside a sports bar. <laughs> um, and you can see there they are irrigating it a little bit, but it has that butterfly milkweed. It has cone flower. It has some sunflowers. This little tiny strip is packed full of insects. Here you see a butterfly visiting milkweed in the later part of the season. This is a small, tiny rain garden from my office building in the parking lot. It's maybe five feet by five feet. Office gardens, 
um, you know, these big buildings we have that are industrial parks or campuses or business centers, you know, we can change that landscaping from those kind of meatball shrubs to something more diverse that, that supports monarchs. This is out of a township building here right outside and this is a way station they've created. So we do see lots of monarchs. This is early in the season, but later in the season we see lots of monarchs visiting these plants and other pollinators. Um, again, leaving those leaves. I know this isn't specific to monarchs, but lots of other butterflies and insects overwinter in that leaf litter. And then management practices. So maybe you already have decent habitat on your land and you want to encourage those native plants to spread or grow or just persist in the landscape. Um, maybe this is a place where you don't have space or resources to plant more habitat. Um, and this is really the first line of defense. If you do have good habitat on your property or in the park you manage or in your landscape, community space, whatever it may be, encouraging uh, the maintenance crew or encouraging yourself, whoever's doing the management, uh, to manage these for their wildlife value can be really, really valuable and a lower intensity way to support conservation. So for monarchs, we focus a lot on mowing. Of course, excessive mowing reduces wildflower abundance and diversity. It can outright kill pollinators. Um, so you see this strip here along the roadway with monarch caterpillars feeding on their host plant. This could be any caterpillar feeding on the host plant, really. Um, if we go through when monarch caterpillars are present to mow at that time, you know, these caterpillars don't have wings. They can't escape. So you're essentially just chopping them up, right? Um, bees, other visit, flower visitors can be in direct harm as well. Um, so mo and monarch caterpillars are not present. This is a really good use of those journey north migration maps I showed earlier, because you can look at them and see if monarchs have been spotted in your area yet in spring. If they have, they're likely laying eggs, so you might want to hold off on mowing. If they have not been there yet, you know, that might be an opportunity to mow. And in fact, um, the Xerces Society has worked with Monarch Joint Venture to create a map of ideal management timing. Again, you know, these, these um, migration times vary a little bit each year. So you do want to cross-reference maybe with Journey North or go out and scout your own plants for caterpillars. But this gives you a nice road map um, on your state. You can look at the area you, you are managing. And down here, look at that time range when it's best for mowing or doing other types of disturbance. And this is available online. If you just Google mowing for monarchs, this will pop up. Pesticides, we don't have a whole lot of time to go into this today. It's a very important topic. If you are interested in this, our pesticide team has multiple um, videos, instructional guides on our website, videos on our YouTube channel on pesticide protection. They are experts at this. Um, they're the ones that help me give device, so they, advice, so they provide support to the pollinator team when we're writing plans for farms or nature areas. Um, but they can have these direct and indirect effects, effects that I mentioned earlier. Most insecticides are broad spectrum, so they kill the pest and a lot of other insects. And herbicides, if not used properly, you know, that overspray can be eliminating not only the weeds you want to get rid of, but the plants that you would like to um, remain in the landscape, those desirable plants like milkweed. Controlling invasive species. This is really critical. Um, I know that people see things like purple loosestrife with bees on them. And yes, it is a good nectar source. And for honey beekeepers, it makes pretty good honey. Uh, but if we let this particular plant take over large areas um, of, of natural space or wild areas, which we don't have much left of, you know, we only have resources that during that time when that particular plant is blooming. So this can be loose strife or knotweed, and it's displacing 
those native plant communities, those diverse native plant communities that a lot of animals depend on. So in turn, it displaces those bees, um, amphibians and other species, especially loosestrife being a, um, a wet, more wetland plant. So managing those, use early detection. You know, if you see some invasive species coming in, get rid of them before they form large co uh, colonies where it's really much more difficult. Keeping monarchs wild, and I'm coming here to the end of the presentation. I know we're getting close, um, but raising monarchs, especially mass rearing monarchs at home in facilities that are not regulated can be very detrimental. Um, we recognize that this is also an, um, a learning opportunity. So if you're doing it for educational purposes, rear a small amount, um, collect caterpillars locally, don't buy them from other um, people that are rearing them in mass quantities. This could be a way that you can get um, monarchs infested with disease and moving them around and then they could spread that disease to their counterparts um, that are naturally living in the landscape around you. So rearing monarchs uh, and releasing lots of them is a not a recommended conservation strategy and carries a lot of risks. We have a whole paper about this um, on our website as well. Community science and engagement is critically important. We cannot gather the amount of data we need to um, you know, say whether an insect, a particular species is at risk if their populations are secure, if they're endangered, um, what the changes over time if we don't have a lot of boots on the ground. And the Xerces Society, although we're growing in size, is still a very small organization. So we rely on people from the community, naturalists, people that just want to get engaged, all ages to help us do these. And we have these uh, community science programs on our website. You could get involved and help us collect um, these data that we need to tell us what's happening. A lot of times these numbers are what we provide to fish and wildlife when we're petitioning for, um, you know, um, and base, uh, for uh, Endangered Species Act. So it's very important that we have these. It contributes to our science-based um, recommendations. Another way for communities to get involved is to become part of our Bee City or Bee Campus program. This is a community-based effort through the Xerces Society where we have people on staff that will guide you through the process. And the mission here is to galvanize com communities to sustain pollinators by providing them with healthy, habitat in your community, a rich variety of native plants, and areas free or nearly free of pesticides. So if you and you know, people on your local green team or your habitat team are willing to get together and form a committee and come to Xerces, ask us for help, apply to be a bee city, we can help with that. Very much uh, similar to the tree city program. I'd like to call out some of these other organizations that the Xerces Society has worked with um, or that are doing uh, also doing these community science programs like Monarch Joint Venture, Journey North, who does those tagging programs and has the map data, uh, Monarch Larva Monitoring Project, and also Project Monarch Health. So these are other organizations you can look up and look on their website as uh, how to get involved, how to take action. Um, these are particularly important opportunities for people who can't do a lot of habitat work, like myself. I live in an apartment complex. I'm not allowed to make a lot of changes, but I get involved in other ways, even outside of my, my main work. We have tons of resources to help you do this. I cannot uh, say enough about the prolific libraries of information we have on our website. Please do visit that if you're looking for something and you can't find it. We likely have it. You're free to contact me directly and I'll send you um, things that I think would be helpful. Um, and this includes planting guides on how to plant and maintain pollinator habitat. And we have some for New Jersey, Pennsylvania, um, we have some for specific states and specific regions. 
And donors really make it possible for us to do this work, to give these webinars, to educate the public, for me to be out on the lands landscape doing habitat installations as I do for my daily work. So please become a member. We're a donor supported nonprofit. You can look at our uh, rating on Charity Navigator and go to xerces.org slash donate um, to, to become a member or to donate to us. If you need more ideas, please contact us, right? We can help. And with that, I'd like to thank everybody today for your attention. I know I went a little bit over time, but I would be happy to stay on and take questions. Thank you, Kelly, that was great. Um, during the presentation, as links were coming up, I was just putting the links into the chat Oh, and you. I'm also compiling all the links and I will send an email out to everyone once the webinar is over with links to Duke Farms resources, Xerces resources, their YouTube channel, the resource center. I have all those links in there. Um, so if there's any, go ahead. I said fantastic. Oh, okay, cool. Okay. Um, so if there's any questions, we have a couple minutes, we'll take a couple, we'll take a few. So you can go ahead and put them in the Q&A or the chat. We're not going to be able to get to all of them. Um, and one that came in pretty early on was asking about the use of insecticides for mosquitoes and that impact on pollinators and especially the uh, controlling the mosquitoes in residential areas. Yes. So I did not show this, but if you do go on our guide, we do have a, a, a guide to take community action on mosquito control. And we have a bigger guide. It's a big booklet on ecological co uh, mosquito control. Um, large scale mosquito sprays, aerial sprays are detrimental to pollinators and other insects. Um, you know, a more targeted approach is treating them in their larval stage with something like BT or something that's more targeted to um, that fly or mosquito species right, in general. But yeah, those widespread, um, you know, uh, sprays really can be detrimental. And they're not that effective for uh, killing mosquitoes. Trying to kill, kill a mosquito in the adult uh, life stages is pretty difficult. Um, the, the things we try to focus on is preventative measures, you know, removing things that are collecting water, removing areas where they may be uh, developing uh, using protection. So I know it's uncomfortable and it may be an inconvenience, but I am a good mosquito host. So I'll wear long pants if I know I'm going fishing or doing something, you know, sitting by the river at night, that kind of thing. Um, please, if you have more questions, contact me. My email is right on this slide here. I can put you in um, contact with our pesticide specialists and they can give you a lot more information if you're looking for for specifics on that. All right, thank you. I think we have one more question we could take and it is asking about honey vine milkweed and if you've ever used it and if that is as beneficial to monarchs and the caterpillars as common in swamp milkweed are. I have not used that. Mm -hmm. I did, during the webinar, I was doing a quick research and it's, it seems like it's, it's kind of similar to dog bane where it is, it, they can lay their eggs on it, but it's not as effective as common in swamp milkweed. So I didn't know if you had a separate answer or more experience with it. No, I mean, we, we, there are things, other things that like black swallow wart, which is an invasive that monarchs will lay eggs on and not go through the developmental stages similar to dog bane. But yeah, I don't have, um, I don't have experience with honey vine. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Thank you everyone for joining. We're going to go ahead and end this. I am going to, once this is over, I'll send an email so you will receive it in your inbox in a few minutes. Um, so thank you everyone for joining on a nice Friday afternoon. Thanks Kelly for doing this. It's nice to be able to have Xerces do some webinars for us. Um, and thank you everyone for joining. Take care. Have a good weekend. Thanks everyone. Bye.